Hello, today's reading of Children in Blood and Bone by Tomi Adeyemi is going to cover chapter 22, 23, and 24. Chapter 22, Amari. Back home at the palace, every window in my quarters only allowed me to look in. Father had the new wing constructed after I was born, insistent that every window could only face the courtyard. The most I could see of the outside world was the leopard orchids of the royal garden in full bloom. The palace is all you need to be concerned with, Father would say, when I begged him for a different view. Orisha's future is decided within these walls. As princess, yours will be too. I tried to hold on to his words, allow palace life to satiate me the way it did mother. I made an effort to socialize with the other Aloys and their daughters. I attempted to find entertainment in palace gossip. But at night, I used to sneak into Inan's quarters and climb out to the balcony overlooking our capital. I would imagine what lay beyond the wooden wall walls of Lagos, the beautiful world I longed to see. One day, I wh would whisper to Binta. One day, indeed, she would smile back. And as I dreamed, I never imagined the hell of the jungle, all the, all the mosquitoes and sweat and jagged stones. But after four days in the desert, I'm convinced there's no limits to the hells Orisha can hold. The desert provides no fox or meat to eat, no water or coconut milk to drink. All it gives us with is sand, endless mountains of sand. Despite the scarf wrapped so tightly around my face, I can barely breathe. Grains settle in my mouth, my nose, my ears. Their persistence is matched only by the scorching sun, a final touch to this bleak wasteland. The longer we travel through it, the more my fingers itch to grab Nala's reins and yank her the other way. But even if we turned around now, where in Sky's name would I go? My own brother hunts me. Father probably desires my head. I can hardly fathom all the lies mother's spinning in my absence. Perhaps if Binta was still at the palace, I would risk crawling back with my tail between my legs. But even she's gone. The sand is all I have left. Sadness swells inside me as I close my eyes and picture her face. Just a brief thought of her is almost enough to take me away from the hell of this desert. If she were here, she'd be smiling, laughing at the grains of sand that got stuck between her teeth. She'd find beauty in all of this. Binta found the beauty in everything. Before I can stop myself, my thoughts of Binta take me further, bringing me back to our days in the palace. One morning when we were young, I snuck her into mother's quarters, eager to show her my favorite jewels. And as I climbed onto the vanity, I rambled on and on about the villages Enon was going to see on his military visits. It's not fair, I whined. He'll go all the way to Ikoyi. He's going to see the actual sea. You'll get your chance. Binta stayed back, hands clamped to her side. No matter how many times I motioned for her to join me, she insisted she couldn't. One day, I draped Mother's prize emerald necklace over my head, captivated by the way it glimmered in the mirror's light. What about you, I asked. When we leave, what village do you want to see? Anything. Binta's eyes lost focus. Everything. She bit her bottom lip as a smile came to her face. I think I'd love it all. No one in my family has ever traveled past Lagos walls. Why not? I wrinkled my nose and rose to my feet, reaching for the case that held Mother's antique headdress. It sat just above my reach. I leaned forward. Amari, don't! Before Binta's words could stop me, I lost my balance. With a jolt, I knocked the case over. It took all of two seconds before everything else came tumbling to the floor. Amari! I'll never know how Mother arrived so quickly. Her voice echoed under the arched entrance of her room as she took in the mess I had made. When I couldn't speak, it was Binta who stepped forward. My deepest apologies, your highness. I was told to polish your ju ju jewelry. Princess of Amari was only coming to my aid. If you must punish someone, it should be me. You lazy brat. Mother snatched up Binta's wrist. Amari's a princess. She's not here to do your chores. Mother, that's not quiet, Mother snapped, snarling as she dragged Binta, Binta away. It's clear we've been too lenient with you. You'd benefit from the teachings of a whip. No, Mother, wait. Nala stumbles, pulling me from the depths of my guilt. Binta's young face fades out of my mind as Zane struggles to keep us from collapsing down a mountain of sand. I grisp, grip the leather stirrups as Zelly leans down and rubs Nala's fur. I'm sorry, girl, Zelly soothes. I promise we'll be there soon. Are you sure? My voice comes out dry, as brittle as the sand surrounding us. 
but I can't tell if the lump in my throat is from the lack of water or the memory of Binta. We're close, Zane turns back, squinting to keep out the sun, even with his eyes nearly shut. His deep brown gaze holds me, making my cheeks flush. If we don't get there today, we'll hit Abeji tomorrow. But what if the sunstone isn't in Abeji? Zelly asks, what if Lacon's lead was wrong? We only have 13 days until the solstice. If it's not here, we're damned. He can't be wrong. The thought makes my empty stomach lurch. All the determination I felt in Chan Noble crumbles. Skies, all of this would be so much easier if Lacon were still alive. With his guidance and magic, Enon pursuing us wouldn't be a threat. We'd have a chance to find the Sunstone. We might already be on our way to the sacred island to perform the ritual. But with Lacon gone, we're no closer to saving the Magi. If anything, we're just running out of time, marching toward our deaths. Lacon wouldn't lead us astray. It's here, Zane paused, craning his neck. And unless that's a mirage, so are we. Zelly and I peer past Zane's broad shoulders. Heat bounces off the sand in waves, blurring the horizon. But in time, a cracked clay wall crystallizes into view. To, to my surprise, we're only three of many travelers making their way into the desert city from all directions. Unlike us, several of the migrating parties travel in caravans crafted from reinforced timber and embellished with gold, vehicles so adorned they have to belong to nobles. A pulse of excitement travels through me as I narrow my eyes to get a closer look. When I was a child, I once overheard father warn his generals about the danger of the desert, a land overpowered with grounders. He claimed their magic could transform every single grain of sand into a lethal weapon. Later that night, I told Binta what I learned as she combed through the tangles of my hair. That's not true, she corrected me. The grounders in the desert are peaceful. They use their magic to create settlements from the sand. In that moment, I pictured what a sand city would look like, unrestrained by the laws and materials governing our architecture. If grounders really did rule the desert, their magnificent cities have crumbled, disappearing alongside them. But after four days in the ghastly desert, the meager settlement of Abeji shimmers. The first sign of hope in this wretched wasteland. Thank the skies. Perhaps we shall survive after all. Shanty tents and clay hairs greet us when we make our way past the wall. Like the swamp slum dwellings of Lagos, the sand huts are stout and square, soaking in the rays of the sun. The largest of the Yahares looms in the distance, bearing a seal I know all too well. The carved snow air flickers in the sun, its sharp fangs bared to bite. A guard post, I croak, tensing in Nala's saddle. Though the royal seal is etched into the clay wall, it waves in my mind like the velvet banners in Father's throne room. After the raid, he abolished the old sea, a gallant bullhorned lion air that always used to make me feel safe. Instead, he proclaimed that our power would be represented by the snow air, riders who, we, who were ruthless, pure. Amari, Zelly hissed, snapping me out of my thoughts. She dismounts Nala and wraps her scarf tighter around her face, urging me to do the same. Let's split up. Zane slides off Nala's back and hands us his canteen. We shouldn't be spotted together. You guys get water. I'll find a place to stay. Zelly nods and walks off, but once again, Zane holds my gaze. You okay? I force a nod, though I cannot bring myself to speak. One glimpse of the royal seal, and it's like my throat has been filled with sand. Just stay close to Zelly, because you are weak, I imagine him spitting, though his dark eyes are kind, because despite the sword you carry, you cannot protect yourself. He gives my arm a gentle squeeze before taking Nala by the reins and walking her in the opposite direction. I stare after his broad figure, fighting my desire to follow until Zelly hisses my name. This will be fine. I put a smile in his eyes, though Zelly doesn't even look my way. I thought things were starting to ease between us after Sokoto, but whatever goodwill I earned was crushed the minute my brother showed up at the temple. For the past four days, Zelly has barely spoken to me, as if I'm the one who killed Lacon. The only time she does seem to look at me, I catch her staring at my back. I stay close as we continue down the empty streets, searching for food in vain. My throat screams for a cold cup of water, a fresh loaf of bread, a nice cut of meat, but unlike the merchant quarters of Lagos, there are no colorful storefronts, no displays of succulent delights. The town appears almost as starved as its surrounding desert. Gods! Zelly curses under her breath, pausing as her shivers worsen, although the sun beats down with a fury 
Her teeth chatter as if she's in an ice bath. Since her awakening, she shakes more and more, recoiling whenever she senses that the spirits of the dead are near. Are there that many, I whisper? She pants when one shiver stops. It's like walking through a burial ground. With heat like this, we probably are. I don't know, Zelly looks around, yanking her scarf closed. Every time one hits, I taste blood. A chill rocks through me, though sweat leaks from every pore. If Zelly can taste blood, I don't want to know why. Perhaps, I pause, stalling in the sand as a pack of men flood into the street. Though they're obscured by capes and masks, their dust-covered clothes bear Orisha's royal seal. Guards! I grab onto Zelly as she reaches for her staff. Each soldier reeks of liquor. Some stumble with every step. My legs quake as if made of water. And then, quick as they came, they disperse, disappearing among the clay a hairs. Get yourself together, Zelly shoves me off her. I fight to not tumble into the sand. There no, there's no sympathy in her gaze. Unlike Zane, her silver eyes rage. I just, the words are weak, though I will them to be strong. I apologize. I was caught off guard. If you're going to act like a little princess, turn yourself into the guards. I'm not here to protect you. I'm here to fight. That's not fair. I wrap my arms around myself. I'm fighting too. Well, seeing as your father created this mess, if I were you, I'd fight a little harder. And with that, Zelly turns, kicking up sand as she storms off. My face burns as I follow, careful to keep my distance this time. We continue toward Ibeji's central square, a collection of tangled streets and square huts crafted from red clay. As we near, we see more nobles gathering, conspicuous with their bright silk caftans and their trailing attendants. Though I don't recognize anyone, I adjust my scarf, worried that even the smallest slip will give my ident identity away. But what are they doing here so far from the capital? There are so many nobles. They're only outnumbered by the laborers in the stocks. I pause for a moment, aghast at the number of them fi filling the narrow path. Before today, I caught only glimpses of the laborers brought in to staff the palace. Always pleasant, clean, groomed to mother's satisfaction. Like Binta, I thought they lived simple lives, safe within the palace walls. I never considered where they came from, where else they might have ended up. Skies! It's almost too hard to bear the sight, mostly diviners. The laborers outnumber the villages by hordes. Dressing in nothing but tattered rags, there's dark skin, blisters under the scorching sun, marred by the dirt and sand seemingly burned into their beings, each is hardly more than a walking skeleton. What's going on, I whisper, tallying the number of children in chains. Almost all of them are young, even the oldest still appears younger than me. I search for the resources they must be mining, the freshly laid roads, the new fortress erected in this desert village, but no sign of their efforts appears. What are they doing here? Zelly locks eyes with a dark girl who has long white hair like hers. The laborer wears a tattered white dress. Her eyes are sunken, devoid of almost all life. They're in the stocks, Zelly mutters. That's where they go where they're told. Surely it isn't always this bad. In Lagos, I saw people who looked even worse. She moved toward the guard post at the central square my, while my insides twist. Though no food fills my stomach, it churns with the truth. All those years sitting silent at the table, sipping tea while people died. I reach forward to fill my canteen at the well, avoiding the guard's leering eyes. Zelly reaches to do the same. The guard's sword slashes down with a fury. We jump back, hearts pounding. His sword cuts into the wooden rim where Zelly's hand rested just seconds before. She grips the staff in her waistband, hand trembling with rage. My eyes follow the sword up to the glaring soldier who wields it. The sun has darkened his mahogany skin, but his gaze shines bright. I know you maggots can't read, he spits at Zelly, but for Sky's sake, learn how to count. He smacks his blade against a weathered sign as sand falls from the grooves in, in the wood. Its faded message clears. One cup, one gold piece. Are you serious? Zelly seeds. We can afford it, I whisper, reeking, reaching into her pack, but they can't. She points at the laborers, the handful carrying buckets, drink water so polluted it might as well be sand. But this isn't time for rebellion. How can Zelly not see that? Our deepest apologies, I step forward, calling forth my most deferential tone. I almost sound believable. Mother would be proud. I place three gold coins in the guard's hand, and I take Zelly's canteen, forcing her to step back as I fill it. Here. I press the canteen into her hand, but Zelly clicks her tongue in disgust. She grabs the canteen and walks back to the laborers, approaching the dark girl in white. Drink, Zelly urges, quick, before your stalker sees. 
The young laborer doesn't spare a second. She drinks the water hungrily, no doubt savoring her first drink in days. And when she finishes a hearty swig, she passes the canteen down to the diviner shackled in front of her. With reluctance, I hand the two remaining canteens over to the other laborers. You're too kind, the girl whispers to Zelly, licking the last droplets off her lips. I'm sorry I can't do more. You've done more than enough. Why are there so many of you, I ask, trying to ignore my dried throat. The stalkers send us here for the arena, the girl nods toward it, a spot just barely visible beyond the clay wall. At first, nothing sticks out against the red dunes and waves of sand, but soon the amphitheater fights its way through. Skies. I've never seen a structure so vast. A collection of weathered arches and pillars, the arena spreads wide across the desert, covering much of its arid land. You're building it? I scrunch my nose. Father would never approve of the stalkers building an edifice like this out here. The desert's too arid. There are only so many people this land can hold. The girl shakes her head. We compete in it. The stalkers say if we win, they'll pay off all our debts. Compete? Zelly wrinkles her brow. For what? Your freedom? And riches, the laborer in front of the girl pipes up, water dripping down his chin. Enough gold to fill the sea. That's not why they have us compete, the girl cuts in. The nobles are already rich. They don't need gold. They're after Baba Lue's relic. Baba Lue, I ask? The god of health and disease, Zelly reminds me. Every god has a legendary relic. Baba Lue is the Ohun Eso Ai, the jewel of life. Is it actually real, I ask? Just a myth, Zelly answers. A story Magi tell diviners before they go to sleep. It's not a myth, the girl says. I've seen it myself. It's more of a stone than a jewel, but it's real. It grants eternal life. Zelly tilts her head and leans forward. This stone, she lowers her voice. What does it look like? Chapter 23, Zelly. The arena buzzes with the drunken chatter of nobles as the sun dips below the horizon. Though night falls, the amphitheater glows with light. Lanterns hang against the pillared walls. We push past the hordes of guards and nobles filling the stone-carved stands. I grip Zane for support, stumbling as we make our way through the weathered sand steps. Where'd all these people come from, Zane mutters. He forces his way through two Kosidon wrapped in dirt-covered caftans. Though Ibeji can't boast more than a few thousand residents, thousands of spectators fill the stands, a surprising number of them merchants and nobles. Everyone stares at the deep basin of the arena floor, united in their excitement for the games. You're shivering, Zane says when we sit. Goosebumps travel up and down my skin. There are hundreds of spirits, I whisper. So many died here. Makes sense if laborers built this place, they'd probably died by the dozens. I nod and I sip from my canteen, hoping to wash the taste of blood from my mouth. No matter what I eat or drink, the copper tang won't go away. There are too many souls around me trapped in the hell of a potty. I was always taught that when Arishans died, the blessed spirits rose to Alafia, peace, a peace from the pain of our earth, a state of being that exists only in the gods' love. One of our sacred duties as reapers was to guide the lost spirits to Alafia, and in exchange they would lend us their strength. But spirits weighed down by sin or trauma can't rise to Alafia. They can't rise from this earth. Bound to their pain, they stay in a potty, reliving the worst moments of their human memories again and again. As a child, I suspected that a potty was a myth, a convenient warning to keep children from misbehaving. But as an awakened reaper, I can feel the spirit's torture, their unyielding agony, their never-ending pain. I scan the arena, unable to believe all the spirits trapped in the hell of a potty within these walls. I've never heard of anything like, in the, like this. What in the gods' names happened here? Should we be looking around, Amari whispers? Search the arena for clues? Let's wait for the competition to start, Zane says. It'll be easier when everyone's distracted. As we wait, I look past the ornate silks of the nobles to inspect the arena's deep metal floor. It's a curious sight among the sand bricks filling the cracked arches and steps. I search for a sign of bloodshed in the iron, the strike of a sword, the cut of giant claws from wild riders, but the metal is untouched and untarnished. What kind of competition is this? A bell rings through the air. My eyes snap up as it sights, as it incites cheers of excitement. Everyone rises to their feet, forcing Amari and me to stand on the steps just to see. 
The cheers grow louder when a masked man shrouded in black ascends a metal staircase, rising to a platform high above the arena floor. There's a strange aura about him, something commanding, something golden. The announcer removes his mask to reveal a smiling light brown face tanned by the sun. He brings a metal cone to his lips. Are you ready? The crowd roars with a ferocity that makes my eardrums ring. A deep rumble thunders in the distance, growing louder and louder until metal gates fly open on the side of the arena floor and an endless wave of water rushes in. This has to be a mirage, yet leader after leader flows in. The water covers the metal ground, crashing with the expanse of a sea. How is this possible? I hiss under my breath, Remem remembering the laborers, no more than skin and bone. So many dying for water and they waste it on this? I can't hear you, the announcer jeers. Are you ready for the battle of a lifetime? And as the drunken crowd screams, metal gates open on the arena's sides. One by one, 10 wooden vessels float in, sailing through the waves of the makeshift sea. Each ship spans almost a dozen meters, mass high, sails unfurled. They float as their crews take position, manning the rows of wooden rudders and cannon lines. On every ship, an elaborately dressed captain stands at the helm. But when I look at the crews, my heart stops. The labor in white sits among dozens of rowers with tears in her dark eyes, the girl who told us of the stone. Her chest heaves up and down. She grips a paddle for life. Tonight, 10 captains from all over Arisha battle for wealth greater than a king's. The captain and crew who win will bathe in a sea of glory, an ocean of endless gold. The announcer raises his hands and two guards roll in a chest, large chest of glittering gold pieces. An echo of awe and greed ripples through the stands. The rules are simple. To win, you must kill the captain and crew of every other boat. Over the past two moons, no one has survived an arena fight. Will tonight finally be the night we crown a victor? The crowd's cheers erupt again. The captain joins in, eyes glittering at the announcer's words. Unlike their helpless crews, they aren't afraid. They only want to win. If a captain wins tonight, a special prize awaits. A recent find greater than any prize we've offered before. I have no doubt rumors of its greatness are why many of you have come tonight. The announcer saunters across, saunters across his platform, building suspense. Dread gathers inside me as he raises the metal cone to his lips again. The captain who wins will walk away with more than just gold. He will receive the jewel of life. Lost to time until this very moment, Babalue's legendary relic, the gift of immortality. The announcer takes the glowing stone from his cloak. Words catch in my throat, more brilliant than the painting Lacon brought to life. The sunstone dazzles, the size of a coconut. The stone shines with oranges, yellows, and reds, pulsing beneath its smooth crystal exterior. The very thing we need to complete the ritual. The last thing we need to bring magic back. The stone grants immortality, Amari cocks her head. Lacon didn't mention that. No, I reply, but it looks like it could. Who do you think will win before Amari can finish? Deafening blasts explode through the air. The arena quakes as the first ship fires. Two cannonballs shoot from the metal muzzles, merciless in their aim. They crash into the next boat's rowers, obliterating lives on, on impact. Ah, vicious pain rips through my body, even though nothing strikes me. The thick taste of blood coats my tongue, stronger than it's ever been. Zell, Zane shouts. At least I think he shouts. It's impossible to hear him over the screams. As the ship sinks, the crowd's cheers blur with the shrieks of the dead overwhelming my mind. I feel it, I say, gritting my teeth to avoid a mangled cry. Each one, each death, a prison I can't escape. The blast of cannonballs shakes the walls. Shattered wood flies through the air. As another ship goes down, blood and corpses rain into the air while injured survivors fight not to drown. Each new death hits me as hard as Lacon's spirit did at Chan Noble, flowing through my mind and body. My head surges with broken, disparate memories. My body harbors all their pain. I blacken and out of the agony, waiting for the horror to end. I get a flash of the girl in white, only now she's drowned in red. I don't know how it long, long it lasts, 10 minutes, 10 days, when the bloodshed's finally over. I'm too weak to think, to breathe, little remains of the 10 ships or their captains, each blown apart at another's hand. 
Looks like another night without a victor, the amount announcer's voice booms over the cries of the spectators. He brandishes the stone, making sure it catches the light. It glimmers above the crimson sea, shining above the corpses floating among the shards of wood. The sight makes the crowd scream louder than they have all night. They want more blood. They want another fight. We'll just have to see if tomorrow's captains can win this magnificent prize. I lean into Zane and I shut my eyes. At this rate, we'll die before we ever touch that stone. Chapter 24, Inan. The distant shouts of stalkers ring over the faint clinks, clinks of construction. Kea's disgruntled barks rain over them. Though reluctant, she appears to be taking the assembly lead. After three days under her rule, rule the bridge is almost complete. But as our path to the other side of the mountain groans, grows, I'm no closer to finding any clues, no matter how far I get. The temple is an enigma, an endless mystery I can't crack. Even loosening my hold on magic isn't enough to track down the girl. I'm running out of time. If I'm to have any chance at finding the girl, I have to let all my magic in. The realization haunts me, challenging everything I believe, but the alternative is far worse. Duty before self. Orisha first. Taking a deep breath, I breathe every last restraint, bit by bit. The ache in my chest decreases. With time, the sting of magic rises to my skin. I hope the scent of the sea will hit me first, but like every day thus, so far, only the scent of timber and coal fills the narrow halls. When I turn a new corner, the scent becomes overwhelming. A turquoise cloud hangs in the air, and I pass my hand through it, allowing Lacon's lingering consciousness to break in. Lacon, stop! Shrieks of laughter ring when I turn another corner. I press against the cool stone as the Centauro's memories overtake me. Phantom children pass, each squealing and painted and naked. Their joy bounces and echoes, sharp against the rock walls. They're not real, I remind myself, heart pounding against my chest. But even as I try to hold on to the lie, the mischievous glint in a child's eyes champions the truth. Torch in hand, I move on, rushing through the temple's narrow halls. And for a moment, a whiff of sea salt hangs in the air, shrouded in the scent of coal. I turn the corner and another turquoise cloud appears. I race to it, teeth clenching as the new flash of Lacon's consciousness takes hold. His timber scent becomes overwhelming. The air shifts. The soft voice sounds. But do you have a name? My body goes rigid. Amari's timid form materializes before my eyes. My sister stares at me in apprehension, fear clouding her amber gaze. An acidic scent wafts into my nostrils. My nose wrinkles at the burn. Everyone has a name, child. Oh, I did not mean Lacon, his voice booms in my head. Omilekan. I almost laugh when I see Amari. She looks ridiculous in commoner clothes, but even after all this, she's the same girl I've always known, a web of emotions spinning behind a wall of silence. My own memory breaks in, the brief look we shared across the broken bridge. I thought I'd be her savior. Instead, I was the cause of her pain. My wealth is increased? Lacon's memory of the Maji girl emerges. She flickers to life in the burn of the torchlight. You remember our tongue? Bits and pieces, she nods. My mother taught it to me when I was young. Finally, after all these days, the scent of the sea hits me like a gust of wind. Yet for the first time since our paths collided, the girl's image doesn't make me reach for my sword. Through Lacon's gaze, she is soft yet striking. Her dark skin seems to glow in the torchlight, highlighting the ghosts behind her silver eyes. She's the one, Lacon's thoughts ring in my mind. Whatever happens, she must survive. The one for what, I wonder out loud, only silence answers. The images of the girl and Amari fade away, leaving me staring after where they used to be. Her scent disappears, though I try to reach for the flash again. Nothing happens. I'm forced to move on. And as my footsteps echo through the temple's nooks and crannies, I feel the change in my body. Suppressing my curse has become a constant drain, a draw on every breath. Though the buzz of magic in my head still makes my stomach clench, my body revels in its new freedom. It's as if I've spent years drowning underwater. For a moment, I get to suck in air. With deep breaths, I press on through the temple, traversing the halls with a new vigor. I chase after the ghosts of Lekon, searching for answers, hoping to find the girl again. And when I turn another corner, the scent of his soul overwhelms me. I enter the domed room. Remnants of Lekon's consciousness pulse stronger than they have. 
all week. A turquoise cloud seems to encompass the entire space. Before I can brace myself, the room flashes in white. Though I stand in the shadows, Lacon's consciousness bathes the jagged walls in light. My jaw drops as I study this stunning mural of the gods. Each portrait floods with brilliant color. What is this? I breathe in awe of that magnificent sight. The paintings are so expressive they appear to come to light. I lift my torch, the gods and goddesses, to the magi who dance at their feet. It's imposing, invading. It unravels everything I've been taught to think. Growing up, Father led me to believe that those who clung to the myth of the gods were weak. They relied on beings they could never see, dedicating their lives to faceless entities. I chose to place my faith in the throne, in Father Orisha, but now, staring at the gods, I can't even bring myself to speak. I marvel at the oceans and forests that spring from their touch, a wor the world of Orisha created by their hand. A strange joy seems to breathe within the layers of paint, filling, filling Orisha with a light I didn't know it could hold. Seeing the mural forces me to see the truth, confirming everything Father told me in the throne room. The gods are real, alive, connecting the threads of the Magi's lives. But if all that is true, why in the sky's name has one forged a connection with me? I scan each portrait again, observing the different types of magic that seem to spring from the god's hands. When I come to a god dressed in rich cobalt robes, I pause. My cursed magic flares at the sight of him. The gods stand tall, imposing with chiseled muscles. A dark blue ipeli stretches across his broad, broad chest like a shawl, vibrant against his dark brown skin. Turquoise smoke twists in his hands, just like the wispy clouds that appear with my curse. And when I move my torchlight, a pulse of energy travels under my scalp. Lacon's voice booms in my head as another blue cloud appears. Ori took the, spice, the piece from Sky Mother's head to become the god of mind, spirit, and dreams. And on Earth, he shared this unique gift with his worshippers, allowing them to connect with all human beings. God of spirit, mind, spirit, and dreams, I whisper to myself, putting all the pieces together, the voices the flickers of other emotions, the dr strange dreamscape I found myself trapped in. This is it, the god of my origin. Anger thrashes inside me with the realization, what right do you have? A few days ago, I didn't even know this god existed, yet he took it upon himself to poison me? Why, I shout, voice echoing inside the dome. I almost expect the god to shout back, yet only silence answers me. You'll regret this, I mutter to myself, not knowing if that makes me insane or if somewhere, despite all the noise of the world, he can hear me. The bastard should rue this day. The magic he's cursed me with will be magic's undoing. My insides twist and I whip around, stomach clenching as I call on my curse even more. There's no fighting it. To find the answers I need, there's only one place I can go. I slide to the ground and close my eyes, letting the world fade as magic slithers through my veins. If I'm going to kill this curse, I need it all. I need to dream.